and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Hey, my name's Steve Riley. I'm one of the worship ministers here at Gateway. And I grew up in a musical family. My dad was a music minister and mom always was there with him singing and either playing piano or organ. They also had a gospel group and they would drag me around with them everywhere they went. So needless to say, music has always been a huge part of my life. It's such a spiritual thing in and of itself. And I think that's why God has always included it in ministry throughout scripture. It can connect our hearts to His. It can make His Word come to life. It can allow us to express our feelings to Him in a way that just talking never could. And it can connect our hearts with each other as we sing in harmony and unity. Some folks may think we just get up together up here every week and jam, but it's way more than that. It's we're a team, we're a family, and we're friends. We work together for a common cause, and that's to create an environment that is welcoming and safe for the church to come together each week and lift our hands and our voices in praise and worship. And we strive to do that with excellence. Not to bring attention to ourselves, but so that we can magnify Jesus. It takes a team to accomplish this, a pretty big team here at Gateway. We would love for you to consider being a part of our team. We'd love to meet with you and determine where you'd best fit in on the worship ministry here at Gateway. Good morning. I don't know how to get this TV on and somebody forgot to turn it on. So just ignore it unless somebody comes up and turns the TV on. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for sharing a little bit about your calling to do what God wants you to do. You know, Danny Rose pointed out to me <clears throat> this morning that there are a lot of WVU coats out there on the table to donate to, to the veterans. Now, that means one of two things. Either WVU is having a bad season or you're giving great sacrifice to dress our veterans up to look good. If you see a Marshall jacket, pull it out. We don't want them wearing those. Joel may think different. Well, thanks for being here today. We're in the second week of our series. <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard the story of Joe Fowler. Walt Disney knew that he, Joe Fowler, was the man he needed for the job. Disney needed a responsible and very capable administrator to oversee the building of his new theme park that would later be called Disneyland and then Disney World. Joe Fowler was a retired rear admiral in the Navy, had a distinguished career, and he was also a master warship builder. He designed a lot of the warships in the fleet. He didn't live far from Disney. He lived down in San Diego. He had all the credentials Disney was looking for. The problem was that he was not interested in the job Disney wanted him to do. He'd worked all his life. He had that great career, and he was looking forward to retirement, spending time with his wife, traveling, doing the things that retired people are supposed to do. And he didn't want such a big responsibility that Disney was, wanted to lay on him. So when Walt Disney called and asked him to lead the charge, he said no. But if you know Walt Disney, you know his story, you know he was very persistent. He was a persistent man, and he asked Joe if he could come down to San Diego and just bring the plans to show him and maybe get his input since he had such great uh, counsel and experience in this area. And Fowler thought, well, there's, there can be no harm in that. Come on down. So Disney got on a plane, and he flew down to San Diego and he spent a little bit of time with Fowler showing him his plan, showing him what he was going to build up there near Anaheim. And he said, hey, why don't you fly back with me tomorrow 
just come on back with me, and I want to just show you the property. I just want to show you the property. Fowler thought, well, there's no harm in that. So the next morning, they got up, got on the plane, went back to Anaheim area, and saw the property. Disney said, hey, uh, why don't you, you know, I want you to be treated right. Why don't you come over to the house for dinner? Come over for a late lunch, early dinner, and let's spend some time. And I just want to get your feeling on what you've seen and the property you've seen. Fowler thought, well, there's no harm in that. So he went over to Disney's house and had dinner and uh, they talked. And after dinner, they went out on this train, a little train that uh, went around the property, Disney's property. And an observer said they must have ridden the circle 90 times, just talking and talking. After the train ride, Disney said, hey, uh, it's too late to fly back to San Diego tonight. Why don't you spend the night and you can go back in the morning? Fowler said, well, there's no harm in that. And uh, that's what he did. He spent the night, was treated royally. The next morning, they had a big breakfast, and Disney said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's go over to the office on our way to the airport. Just go over to the office, and I want to show you the model that the guys are working on uh, in the office. Fowler thought, well, there, there's, there's no harm in that. So got in the car, and they drove to Disney's office, and he opened an adjacent door to the office, and there inside were 12 men feverishly working on the the set, the model that would later become Disneyland. Disney and Fowler went in, and Disney got the attention of the room. He said, gentlemen, can I have your attention? This is Joe Fowler, and he is now in charge of this project. And he shut the door. And that's how Joe Fowler, you can Google this, and you know that's the, the age we live in. Everything I say, you can Google and check out Fowler's story and how he became the chief designer of not just Disneyland, but Disney World. He kind of got Disneyed into it. Now, unfortunately, there are many times in the church where I feel like that's how we recruit volunteers. We kind of dangle some bait up there and say it's only for one Sunday or one event, and you say, well, there's no harm in that. And the next thing you know, you're our uh, preschool children's director. Or you, 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 you've got a spot on for life with no end in sight. But it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't really have to be that way. Church staff shouldn't have to beg. We shouldn't have to trick. We shouldn't have to con or Disney anybody into serving the Lord. It should just be natural for us as believers. We should want to step up and serve wherever God needs us to serve. And maybe you are serving today, and I hope you are. And if you're not, I pray that you'd find a place to expend your energies in coordination and in partnership with what God is doing in the world. If you're not doing that, you should be. If you're a believer, if you're a believer. The Bible says, Jesus talking in Matthew 20, he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, if Jesus himself didn't come to be served, but he came to serve, then I think it bears saying that you and I are not here to be served, but to serve. Yet so often, far too often, even in our church experience, and not just church, not just our Christian walk, but even out in the, in the world, even out in the community, at our jobs, somehow we get the mistaken notion that others are here for me, make me happy, do what I want you to do, contribute to my plans and my goals and my aspirations. And we somehow miss that we're not here for that. We're here to give. We're here to serve. And so we started that new series. I love the song we sang. Uh, 
you know, the last week and today, available. What an incredible song. And I really want you to think about that song when you sing that song. That, that is a song of commitment. It's a song of dedication. It's a song of surrender. All I am, all I have, Lord, is yours. I'm available. Now, to help us as a church be available in this series, we started with teaching a biblical uh, view of why we should serve. This is a biblical view, you know, everything in your life. And I'm going to uh, underline that word, everything in your life. You should start it with what does God say about this? I, I, don't, I can't think of anything that you wouldn't say that to. I can't think of any area of your life that you wouldn't first stop and say, what does God say about this? So you need a biblical view of it, a biblical worldview. If there's anything in your life that you said, no, I don't need to know what God says here, then I think you're off course. I think you're mistaken. Uh, everything in your life, you need to start by saying, what does God say about this? Because God made you. God made you the way you are. God shaped you, God formed you, and he did that with a purpose in mind. Therefore, if you want to live out your purpose for God, you should start with that question. And so we, we, we looked at this biblical worldview uh, from Isaiah chapter 6. This is the view. This is, this is a view, and there's other contributing passages we could have turned to. But Isaiah, you remember, saw the image of God. He was overwhelmed by this awesomeness, this glory, this holiness of God. He, and, and so there's, there's three points to this uh, biblical worldview of service. My responsibility to serve comes from, number one, God's glory and holiness. God is God. We're not. God is in charge and we're not. And if you ever think you're in charge, just wait. Just wait. And something's going to happen where you're like, man, I didn't plan for that to happen. I must not be in charge. Who is? God is. And he, he was overwhelmed by his sinfulness. Why would God even give me a second look? Why would he even think he would use me for his glory? I am so sinful and I live among a people of sin. That's what he said. And I think that's true of us today. But then he realized that he had forgiveness, that forgiveness qualifies you to serve it qualifies you to serve. You are saved to serve. So we want to hear the word of the Lord today, and we want to answer like Isaiah, here I am, I, Lord, send me. Remember, availability is your greatest ability. It doesn't matter what you can do, how well you can do it. If you don't show up with it, it, it doesn't matter, does it? Because uh, nobody's getting any benefit out of it. No matter how good you are, if you're not showing up, you're not available you might as well not have that ability. So this is, this is where we are. We are, uh, we are this biblical view, and we used, uh, you know, we're highlighting areas in our church. Today is the worship ministry. Steve talked about that. Steve's been leading our worship ministry for several years now. And I just want to tell you, in our worship ministry, there are lots of pieces that have to take place. The, on the stage, behind the stage, back there in the booth, in lots of places. If you think, well, how could they ever use me in the worship ministry? Talk to Steve. You might say, I can't sing, I can't play an instrument. There are things you probably could do if worship ministry is touching your heart, if it's a passion of yours. So last week we talked about this acronym SHAPE, S-H-A-P-E. That's kind of the model we're using for the series. We talked about your discovering my ministry shape. And we saw that it stands for something. These letters stand for spiritual gift, heart, abilities, personality, experiences. All those things make you who you are and make you suited to serve somewhere. Jeremiah said in the message version, God said, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. What are God's plans for you? You have any idea? You know what God wants to do with you, through you? Do you know what he's, what he's putting in front of you to go after? 
So today we're going to talk about, we talked about the S, the spiritual gift. I hope you dived into that. There's lots more there that we could cover. You have a gift if you're a believer. If you're a Christian, you have a spiritual gift. Maybe you have more, and it's for the building up of the body of Christ. Today we're going to talk about the H, and that's your heart. That's your heart. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Now, this doesn't mean when you preach or when you sing or when you play an instrument, whatever you do, you may uh, be in the business world, you may be in the uh, food industry, you might be in healthcare, you might be in education, you could be in some kind of government job. Whatever it is you do, Paul says, do it with all your heart. In other words, don't leave your heart out of it. You want a boring job? You want a, you want a boring life? Then you do something that your heart's not in. And chances are you won't do that for very long. People who pour their heart into their life, their job, their careers, those are the people who get to the end and say, wow, where did the time go? I enjoyed every minute of it. Now, in our model, the shape model, the heart refers to the bundle of desires in you, the hopes you have, your interests, your ambitions, your dreams, your affections. It's what you love to do. It's what you care about the most. What do you care about the most? What is it that you care about? What does that bundle reveal about you? What makes you cry? I don't know the last time you cried. If it was, if, if you're like me, it was probably at a commercial or something, you know. That's where we're getting to the older we get. Commercials make us cry. Anybody cry at a commercial? One thing I've resolved never to cry about is a Hallmark movie. Resolved never to cry, but I think there was one not too long ago that almost made me cry. Uh, you know, there's sometimes they put veterans on there and soldiers and just gets to you. Well, you have something that touches you in your heart. You have something that stirs you. And if you don't know what that is yet, we're going we're gonna to challenge you to pray about that. In the Bible, there are lots of stories about how people's hearts were touched. There's one in particular that I want to share with you this morning, and it's the story of a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah lived in the middle of the 5th century B.C. Nehemiah has a book of the Bible named after him. He was a high official in the, in the, uh, the Persian king Artaxerxes I. He was the cupbearer to the king. Now, you know what a cupbearer does, don't you? The cupbearer is pretty close to the king. He's very uh, influential. He's very powerful. It doesn't sound like a powerful title, but it was a very powerful position. He was one of the most trusted men because he, before the king received the food, he would taste the food or he would taste the drink or whatever it was. And, and he was in charge of kind of like all the servants Bring it to me before you take it to him. It's got to be suitable to him, and I know what's suitable to him. Whatever it is, you got, a, you got somebody that wants to go see the king, you bring him through me. You got some food you want to serve the king, you bring it through me. And so I'm going to taste it first. I'm going to put my life on the line. And if Nehemiah dropped dead from something he drank or ate, guess what? The king didn't eat or drink that. So... I don't know how many people they went through, but Nehemiah seems to have had this position for some time. Now, let me tell you how Nehemiah got to where he was. The kingdom of Israel was a great kingdom under David and Solomon. You remember, <clears throat> the Bible says David extended the borders. Solomon was a king where people came from miles around. Even the queen of Sheba came to hear his wisdom. He was so wise, people wrote about it, and he, he wrote many of the Proverbs and, and the book of Ecclesiastes and some other things that we have in our Bible. <clears throat> and so at that time, the kingdom was huge. It was the superpower kingdom of the ancient world. But Solomon sinned. Solomon took foreign wives and allowed them to bring their foreign gods. And, and so God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip this kingdom in half, and that's what happened. 
Once Solomon died, the kingdom was ripped in half. There was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And for a couple hundred years, the northern kingdom existed independently as Israel, and the southern kingdom existed as Judah. You remember this from your uh, Old Testament. And, uh, and, and so eventually their sin was great. There were evil kings and good kings, but mostly evil kings in Israel. And God finally allowed the Assyrians to come in in 721 and wipe out the kingdom. And they took people captive. They, they took the nobles, anybody that could uh, put a group back together and revolt, they, they either killed them or took them captive. They left some people there. They left some poor people there, some unimportant people there, but they took all the important people into captivity. And that was in 721. About 130 years later, Judah fell, the southern kingdom. Of course, Judah is the, uh, you know, the kingdom of just a, a, a couple, two or three tribes, and it's the, it's the tribe from which we get the Messiah. And so in 587, the Babylonians came, and they, they destroyed Judah. So the Israelite nation was gone. It was finished. They were in captivity. This is when the books of Esther were written. Daniel was written. Uh, this is the, when, when the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were written during this time. And so it was at this time that Nehemiah's people, his family had come as captives into the uh, Babylonian empire. And finally, when the Persians took over, Nehemiah, because of who he was and God's favor on him, rose to this position as cupbearer to the king. And so this is where Nehemiah is. I want you to see how the book starts. I want you to see what touched his heart, what stirred his heart. Nehemiah 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, you know that month, don't you? Kislev. It's about November-ish. In the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. Now, I didn't tell you this, but some kings had allowed some of the Jews to go back. A man by the name of Zerubbabel, a Jewish leader, led some back, and they rebuilt the temple. I need to interject this here. A man by the name of Ezra, we have a book after him, he went back and he led some reforms and the people began to build the city, but the city was vulnerable because they had not rebuilt the wall. So here we go. Nehemiah says, I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now I want you to notice, here's the verse where Nehemiah's heart was stirred. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So what was it? What was it that moved him? What was it that stirred his heart? What, what made him cry? What made Nehemiah cry? It was the people of God. He loved the people of God. He loved his hometown. He loved the place of his people. You see, these were his family. These people who were back there were suffering, who were being attacked. He loved them. Their mission was his mission. Their plan was his plan. If they failed, he suffered. I don't know if you've ever felt that way about someone. If you love someone so much, you want to see them succeed. You know, there are times when somebody gets a promotion or they achieve some level of success, and in your heart, in my heart, maybe there's some animosity or some jealousy. And that's, uh, that's not good. You know, we ought to be happy for people who, uh, who do well, who do well. And that's hard to grow, though. It's hard to grow for people we don't like. It's hard to be happy for people we're not close to. But if there are people who are close to your heart, your family members, maybe a child or a grandchild or a cousin or a relative or someone, and they succeed or they do well, it's easy to be happy for them. 
And if they come down with sickness or if they suffer some tragedy in their life, they have some loss, then we hurt. You know what I mean? Anybody felt that? Anybody had a family member who's gotten sick or someone who's struggling or someone who's had a hard time and you don't understand all the details, but for some reason your heart is heavy? Sure you have. Sure you have. And if you haven't, just hold on. You will. You will. Because it'll happen to you. It'll happen to you. And your heart is moved by this. Maybe it's, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that you, uh, that you see on the street. It's a homeless person. Or perhaps it's young children in Haiti. If you'd told me 12 years ago, Dave, Pastor Dave, you're going to have a heart for Haiti. You're going to love to go, and you're going to love to help. You're going to love to minister to those people. I would have said, how in the world will this ever happen? There's no way. I had spent over 10 years here. 12 years here, and it never happened. But then God works the way God works. And now, if you look inside my heart, you'll see a lot of things that I love and care for. But one of the things you'll see is a little shape of Haiti. I know some of you are like that. Some of you have gone, some of you have been on a trip, and you have this heart for these kids and these people who are living, still living in the 21st century, living on dirt floors with no electricity. It's right here in the 21st century where you and I live. And you, as a church, have done so much to help. You've done so much to love and support. So I think, in a way, this church has a heart for Haiti. But it could be something else. It could be, it could be recovery. It could be uh, people who are uh, having marital problems. It might be people who have kids with special needs. And you develop this heart because maybe you've been there, maybe you are there, and you want to help people who are struggling, who are suffering. What's God doing in your heart today? You know what Nehemiah did after he cried? He prayed. He prayed. Nehemiah prayed. He said, God, do you know what's going on? And I love this prayer of Nehemiah in the rest of chapter 1. He reminds God of all that God has done and the the blessing that God had given to him and to his people, even though they were in exile. He said, God, you're still faithful. You're still the one. God, but what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about this? You know what God said? God said, you know, sure, I can do something about that. All I need is a volunteer. Do you know anyone? You know, this is ordinarily the time in, uh, in the church where Someone might come to me or come to one of our staff members and say, we need a ministry to this. We need a ministry to that. And I'd be wrong if I didn't do this, but what I typically do is, okay, will you lead that ministry? And they're like, whoa, wait a minute. I don't have time to lead that ministry. I'm just thinking this is what you ought to do. No, 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 no. God's touching your heart for this. And this is why maybe you're letting God touch your heart, but you're not willing to step forward with what what God is touching your heart with. It's like, I don't have time for this. We we need to make time for what God is calling us to do. Amen? Need to make time for that. So Nehemiah became available to be the answer to his own prayer. Isn't that cool? God, we need to do this. God said, okay, let's do this. You. You. And you need to say, okay, here I am. Send me. I wonder wonder what's in your heart. You know, this kind of of heart and this kind of passion inspires people. It's inspiring to see someone living out their passion for God, doing what God has touched their heart to do. What's not inspiring is someone wasting that. Someone trying to pursue their own things and living their life in reckless ways out there in the world, just trying to do for themselves and accumulate more for themselves and make themselves happy and pursue self-gratification or whatever. That's what's disappointing, isn't it? It's disappointing to see your kids and your grandkids and your friends and your family and even yourself waste their life, spend their time doing things that really aren't going to matter. 
in the long run. That's what we ought to do is find out what's going to matter, what's going to last, what's going to follow me into eternity. What does God want done? Now, God, break my heart for something that breaks yours. The Bible says in Nehemiah 4, 6, this is how This is how inspiring this was. Nehemiah says, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. Do you know how inspiring it might be to someone else, to a group of people, if you would let God touch your heart and then just go with it? Just go with it and see what happens and see how many people are touched because if you're doing what God wants done, if what's breaking your heart is also breaking his heart, I promise you it will inspire others to get involved. If you're not, if you put that down, if you're saying, you know, I know they're going to ask me to do this, even though it's breaking my, if it's breaking your heart enough, you're, you're going to fight through that and you're going to say, God, I got to do something about this. But I know people, I know people who have been touched in their heart to do something for God and they said, no, God will let you say no. They've squelched it. They put it down. And today, there, many of them that I know may not even be in the church anymore, may not even be walking with the Lord because they just kept pushing that down. Do you realize the danger you're putting your soul in if you say no to God? Jack Sanford tells a story of an old family well his family used to use in uh, rural New Hampshire, it was a it was a well where they they actually pulled the bucket up. It was in his family for a couple hundred years, and and the water was so good, it was crisp and refreshing and cold. As the years passed, and, and his father grew up there, and then he grew up there with this old well. As the years passed, they began to update the vacation home there on the lake. And they had gone through times when water was scarce around, but that well never ran dry. Other people were going to the lake to get water and having to boil it, but their well never ran dry. But as the years came, they began to update the house. They put electricity in the house and indoor plumbing, and they got uh, corporate water, you know, from uh, the local town, and they stopped using the well. One day when Sanford was not an older man, he said he had a craving for this, for this water that he had had as a boy. He went to the old well, it was still there, and he took the cover off and he lowered the bucket and he didn't hear anything and he raised the bucket and to his dismay, there was no water in it. And he was like, what happened here? And so he went to the town to inquire, you know, what did the water shortage happen? What happened? And they said, well, this kind of well is fed by underground streams and yeah, in order to keep the underground streams from uh, to, to, to continue feeding the well, you have to drink water out of the well. You have to keep pouring it out so it'll keep pouring in. And that's what they had stopped doing. They had stopped getting water from the well. And so the rivulets, that's what they're called, rivulets, were dried up, clogged up. Now there was no more water. And I think that's a perfect a perfect illustration of what happens in your life, in your spirit, in your soul, if you put a lid on what God is moving your heart to do. I think of what Mordecai told his cousin Esther when he said, you know, if you say no to God, if you don't do this, God's gonna use somebody else. God will get it done, but he'll use somebody else. And who knows, but that you have come to such a position for such a time as this. God's not going to force you into his kingdom. He's not going to force you into service. He's not going to trick you into a room and put you in charge. God says, I'm just going to stir your heart. I'm going to stir your heart. I'm going to make you cry about something. If you'll ask me, if you'll pray, I'll, I'll show you where you're suited to serve, what's going to touch your heart if you'll just become available. You know, there was another man who looked over this people of God, the same city that Nehemiah wept over. 
this man's name was Jesus several hundred years later, and he, he looked at this city and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. But even so, he went and died on a hill for them. What's God doing in your heart? What's he stirring there? It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. God can use you. You can become available to him. God will touch your heart for something. Let's pray about that. Lord, thank you. Thank you for counting us worthy to touch our heart, to stir us, to move us, to create emotion in us, tears, a burden of tears. And Lord, help us to turn to you in prayer and then become an answer to our own prayer. That's what we're asking today, God. Would you move in this room? Would you, would you touch a heart today that's been wandering, that's been straying from you? Would you bring them back into the fold and let them be reminded that you can use them? You have great plans for their life. That's my prayer in Jesus' name.